Well, good morning, good evening, good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Naparstic at the University of Tennessee, and I'm just your Zoom host for this wonderful event. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a Global Dallas Studies Forum event. The Global Dallas Studies Forum uh, is a recent collaborative effort among scholars of Dallas Studies uh, to try to foster a truly global uh, community around the study of Taoism, and also to raise the study, excuse me, to raise the profile of Dallas Studies uh, for all of us. Uh, so this is the fourth event uh, that we put on every two months or so. So please take a look at our website that I'm putting in the chat right now uh, for more information on the Global Dallas Studies Forum and upcoming events, as well as past events too. Um, before I turn it over to Professor Wang, uh, who is our MC in earnest, uh, I want to quickly alert you that uh, some of the details of our Zoom meeting today, we are recording the event. And you'll be able to find a recording once it's available back at that website that I just put up in the chat. Um, and finally, as we've chosen this meeting format for the Zoom event uh, to create a more interactive experience, especially for the question and answer period at the end, I'll ask you to please make sure that your microphones are muted before we begin. Um, and that is that. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Wang, Wang Gang, Associate Professor at the University of Florida. Thank you, Michael. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Chinese friends, good morning. Today, our uh, Global Dollar Study Forum, the uh, uh, topic is Dollar Archaeology. Uh, this uh, this uh, event uh, is to introduce uh, the project advanced, advancing Taoism epigraphic and archaeological method as sources for Taoist uh, lived religion. Uh, today's speaker. Uh, we have two speakers today. Today's speaker, uh, 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 Professor Gil Ratz of uh, Dartmouth University uh, College, and uh, he will uh, he will give uh, kind of two talks. The first part is his introduction to the project, and the the, the second part is his presentation. Uh, about the, the topical presentation is uh, stele, statue, and uh, text, two examples. The second speaker, uh, uh, his topic is a survey of sources. OK, uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Gil Ratz. <clears throat> right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening. Good night. <laughs> Wherever you are, uh, this is truly, truly, uh, I can see by the number of people that this is a truly global occasion. Um, so really great to see you all here at the Global Taoist Studies Forum. <clears throat> is, uh, my name is Gil Raz and I teach at Dartmouth College. Um, and has already been introduced, the, this forum, the point of this forum is to try introduce and share different facets of Taoist studies with the hope of creating a sort of a more vibrant community of Taoist scholars and to encourage um, more communication, participation among all of us. So what we wanted today is share and tell you a little bit about this project um, that I and my research partners have been working on for, uh, for a number of years. And our plan today is, is quite simple. Uh, first, I'll, I'll introduce the project members, the objectives of the project, and perhaps um, in, most importantly, tell you about the process by which the project came together, um, including uh, looking for funding and applying for funding, and hopefully for those of us who are um, younger members of the audience who are looking for um, collaborative projects, this might give you some ideas of how to go about creating such projects. Um, next, uh, Bai Bing of Sichuan University, 
uh, will present us with a general survey of the many archaeological and epigraphic sources for the study of Taoism. Um, and in the third part of, of the presentation, um, I'll introduce um, uh, stilly statues, just Shang Pei, and, and how using them across with texts can, can augment and complicate our understanding of Taoism. And I, prom mm -hmm. and I promise here two examples, but I will actually only do one. Um, so first, let me introduce um, the principal investigators of the project. <clears throat> um, Professor Li Song from um, Beijing University Art Institute, who specializes in Taoist art, um, who currently is organizing a, a really wonderful exhibit at the Yong Legong, uh, or the Yong Legong murals. He has numerous publications. So here I just um, chose this most relevant one to illustrate um, the first volume of the uh, Zhongguo Dao Jiao Mei Shu Shi. Uh, Professor Bai Bin <clears throat> from the Archaeology Department of Sichuan University focuses on excavation and analysis of, of archaeological sites, um, and specializing in Taoist materials. He too has far too many um, publications to even mention, such as chose this representative one, volume one of uh, Zhongguo, uh, Zhongguo uh, Daojiao Kaogu, which is a six volume um, monumental work that he published together with his own teacher, uh, Professor Zhang Shunliao, uh, one of the pioneers in the field of Taoist archaeology. And Bai Bin's students are also great, and I spent quite a few wonderful days with his own students running around the mountains of Sichuan, uh, and some of the photos you'll see are from those days. Um, Professor uh, Lei Wen from the Institute of, uh, Institute of History, Chinese Academy of Social Science, specializes in the history of Tang Taoism and does um, you know, really incredible detective work using tomb epitaphs, tracing Taoist networks and refining our knowledge of social history of Taoism during the Tang. Um, again, he has far too many uh, publications to list. So I'll, I'll just put a few recent ones, almost random ones, but um, this but the second one here about the Gui Fei Zhe maybe just remember this title because it might show up in, in a few minutes. And finally, our gracious host today, uh, Professor Richard Wang, Wang Gang, how teaches in the University of Florida, specializes in study of Taoism during the Ming. Uh, much of his work relies on careful analysis of temple inscriptions to gain new insights into Taoist networks, court relations, and social significance. Among his many publications, of course, is his book, Ming Prince and Taoism. But he's currently working using similar methodology on a new project called Lineages Embedded in Temple Networks, Taoism Local Society in Ming, uh, China. Uh, myself, uh, I, as some of you know, work on much earlier period. Uh, in this project, my main focus are uh, Buddha Taoist stilis of the Northern Dynasties. And I'll have a few more uh, words to say about these uh, in a few minutes. Um, before telling you about the history and development of the project, um, I want to provide you with a succinct project summary. This is a multi-year project funded by the Luce Foundation. It aims at advancing the study of Taoism by using archaeological and epigraphic materials, including statues um, such as one here, cave shrines. This is the Rensho um, um, temple, um, sort of cave shrine in, 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 in Sichuan, um, steles and temple inscriptions, and inscribed tomb epitaphs. This is the uh, 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 epitaph that Lei Wen uh, um, researches in his article I, I told you about before. And we hope to introduce and use these understudied material sources to augment, supplement, and most importantly, challenge the canonical textual sources in understanding the social history of Taoism and to explore developments and changes in ritual practices that are often invisible in their written records. We don't really have any geographic um, limits. We examine Taoist source materials wherever they're found, but we do stress the importance of local traditions and local developments. Uh, in terms of time, we focus on materials from the late Han to the Ming, uh, roughly third to 16th century. Um, Bai Bin, um, Professor Bai Bin will give us a far more detailed overview of the sources that we explore in this project. Now, how does this project develop? <clears throat> uh, a few years ago, I was invited to a conference in Taipei on scriptural Taoism and local religion. That's the publication came out of it. Um, in, in, in my paper, um, what I questioned was the idea of the Taoist canon and especially of taking the text collected in the canon as a standard for defining Taoism as a religion. 
And I pointed out that even at the earliest stage of compiling the Taoist canon, that is the efforts by Lucio Jing to codify the text in the three caverns of Sandong, even at that point, there were many texts and practices that were outside of these efforts. Um, that's one thing. <clears throat> now, histories of Taoism usually treat these groups of texts in the canon as representing clearly defined social units or as lineages, Tao Pai. Now, instead, I think, and, it, and you have some of the main ones here, these ancestral masters, Shangqing, Lingbao, and all kinds of variations of that. Instead, I think um, a much more flexible term to use would be com communities of practice, which allows us to define a group by its practices rather than forcing it into textual categories. And this would be very important when we think about some of the materials we'll be looking at in a few minutes. Um, so well, in, in this paper, I focused on, on Dunhuang manuscripts, but I also discussed two stelies from the Northern dynasties. First, I talked about the Shi family stele from 523, now kept at the Lintong Museum. This is the front face of it, um, um, the Taoist face of it. Um, <clears throat> and the two, this is a two meter tall stele. It's one of the largest ones of, 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 the, of, the, of these steles. It's a four sided stele. Okay, so it's, it's, if, you, if you open up, that's what it looks like. So you have the Taoist side, the Buddhist side, um, and on the two sides, you again, you have Buddhist and Taoist images. And <clears throat> um, so images of Buddha Lord Lao carved on, on the different facets of the stele um, includes a votive statement. Um, it also names of nearly 200 donors who identify themselves either Taoist or Buddhist or simply members of the community. And a sentence, this is just a single sentence from a long, long inscription um, but a sentence quoted here from the votive statement exemplifies a religious vision of the community, a form of Buddha Taoism, if you might say, rarely if at all is found in the canonic texts. The second um, stele I discussed at that point um, was a Xin Yanzhi stele from 548. Uh, this one is a kept at Yao Wangshan. And this also is a four sided stele, again, with images of Buddha and Lord Lao on different facets. Um, and the votive description, again, this is just one section of it, um, includes an especially interesting uh, version of the conversion of barbarians discourse of the, of the Hua Hu uh, kind of discourse. And again, a version we don't really have in, 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 in other texts. I'm not gonna go any further into these two stilis here, um, but we need to remember that Tao scripture of the period um, of the special masters, Shangqing or Lingba traditions rarely refer to physical images of Lord Lao or of the Tao. There are some obscure references to statues in Lingba scriptures, but in general, it seems that Tao's ritual schemes simply not have room for icons. The few references we have are generally negative, and we must note that Lu Xu Jing criticism of, of course suggested, sorry, um, Lu Xu Jing's criticism um, of statues implies that some people were using statues but it's very unclear what these images were, right? So we have Tao Hongjing who, 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 who does both Buddhist and Taoist practice. It's emphasized that while in the Buddhist hall he had statues and Taoism, he did not have so some obscure references mentioned that Ko Chen Zhe perhaps made statues, but there's no reference to that in his own, in, in his own texts. So we have a sense at some point in the fifth century, um, there was an emergence of, 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 of images we don't really have them in the texts, but we do have them here. <clears throat> Even in the earliest, um, this amb ambiguity to statues among Taoists was evident even in the earliest sort of canonic um, text that really advocates making statues um, that actually quotes directly from the Tao Te Ching saying the great image has no form. Um, it quotes the Tao Te Ching 14. So this ambiguity is there um, present, even in the early seventh century. And yet we have evidence of the Taoists making statues at the local level, seemingly countering the dominant textual ritual codices of the period, right? The authors of these votive inscriptions on the stele show they were fully aware of the theological implications of this practice. The two steles that I just mentioned are part of a very large cache of, of, st of Stella several dozen extant examples that were almost all created around the Chang'an area. So these are some of the sites um, where we have um, extant stili. 
Um, and then there's a couple more in, in, in a few more in Luoyang and in, in, in Raichang here as well. Um, and they're all created within a single century. So it's a very localized um, tradition, both in time and in space. These steels reveal a local community of practice with its own lived religion, with a particular set of practices selected from a variety of Buddhist and Taoist sources. As I began to explore more of the Taoist liturgical epigraphic sources, I realized that by focusing on local contexts within specific temporal and geographic contexts, we can have much clearer insights into the history of Taoism than trying to fit these local materials into the textual narratives. So this approach, <clears throat> borrows the notion of lived religion, which originated in the study of modern religion, but has now also been used to analyze Greco-Roman religion. But lived religion, as you see here, these are some of the sort of mythological statements I have in, 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 in our application, um, focuses on individual com or communal usage of religion, everyday experience, practice, expressions, interactions. Um, so the definition of what religion is, and it really privileges local, um, local agency. And I think what's most important for our purpose here, that this approach allows us to discuss and analyze local religious activity, not as derivative or deviant or superficial um, of forms of institutional canonic prescriptive religious models, right? But in sites of innovation and creativity. So very often when people talk about these kind of statues or these kind of material practices, which seem to deviate from the canonic standards to say, well, these are locals and they're kind of merging with the locality and it's really sort of some kind of superficial deviant form of the religion. I'm sort of saying actually it's probably, it should, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, these local sites are in fact where innovation creativity occurs, which is exactly what is happening here. Um, so in, this, in my particular case, the way I talk about my stilis is, is that it's a lived religion of a local Taoist community of practice with particular vision of Taoism and Buddhism. But for each of the various other sites and examples that we have, we would have different sets of questions that are being applied. So this became the theoretical framework with which I approached the study of the stili and which I adopted when writing up the research proposal for the Luce Foundation. So this proposal, um, the application took um, over, over two years. And, and I started to think about this as I began to think of another way stilis in a larger context of Taoist statues, inscriptions, and cave shrines. They realized that there were no comprehensive studies on the topic of Taoist archeology span and epigraphy. So over, of, over two years in 2016, 2017, I traveled to the site of the stilis and other Taoist archeological sites um, and I met with uh, professors Li Song and with Bai Bin and Lei Wen and Richard Wang and others also. At the same time, I met a few times representatives from the Luce Foundation who helped me create the application to them. So what is it they expect? Um, and, and we still wrote it sort of together. Um, and that, so I worked on this application. The project we envisioned um, is extended over four years, it consists of a series of workshops and conferences near important sites um, it's, and they're followed by site visits. And the point was to introduce a topic of Taoist archeological and epigraphic sources and related materials to map out the landscape, so to speak, of these materials to consider methodologies for using them to enhance our knowledge and understanding of, of Taoism. Um, while preparing and the application, I began organizing a series of related panels at the AES and AR annual meetings, um, and especially trying to encourage grad students and young scholars to participate. So here you have some, some examples of these, of these um, panels. There are a few more, but they're not necessarily focused on, on these. Our first meeting, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> our, the first meeting um, of, of the actual um, uh, group was held at Dartmouth in, uh, in November uh, 2019. That's when we actually got the funding um, and we had um, seven or eight people come and present their papers. Um, this was really a wonderful occasion. Um, this was followed a few months later in, with our first meeting in China, organized by Professor Bai Bin and his students um, in, in Sichuan. Um, again, there were over um, 28 presenters in that conference, ranging from really, um, really established scholars like Zhang Shun Liao and Yong Guo, all the way down to PhD students. Um, and this, and this um, three days in, in Chengdu 
were followed by visits to our uh, um, various sites, such as uh, to Changyan, to uh, Shemenshan, um, to Nanshan, and so on. <clears throat> Um, and currently, and we plan to do a conference in, in the summer of 2020 uh, that was hoped to be held at, um, in Shanxi Shefan um, And we, we followed, would have been followed again by, by visits. Um, of course, because of, um, this is being organized by Professor Liu Ke from the Art Institute in, in, at, at Shanxi Normal University. Um, due to COVID, of course, this has been postponed. Um, we hope that, Right now we're scheduled for December, but more likely it will be probably be done in um, summer of 2022. So again, we encourage, especially encourage grad students to participate all these upcoming planned events and we look forward to meeting many of you at our conferences and at the DAOI sites. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Gail. Uh, then, uh, <clears throat> Uh, please uh, join me uh, welcoming uh, Professor Li Song. Uh, uh, Li Song Jiao Shu, now it's your turn to say, okay? Oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, uh, uh, Bai Bing Jiao Shu. Okay, okay. I'm very happy to be able to participate in this international conference. We're still in China, so we're still in the evening. 这个这个明天说晚上好但你们在在美国应该是早上好哈各位嗯哎我的分享呢好像我看一下我好像没法分享我的ppt 你你有能不能你 Mike, any 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 tips? No, I don't know why it's not working. Sorry. Mike, did you make um yep. him a co-host? I did. Yep. yep. Okay. Thank you. We we tried it. We tried it a few minutes ago. It was working. Yeah. Let's try can again. Send file to one of you so that you can share from your end. No, not at the moment. Let me try again now. Yep. Hop. Hop. Ah, uh, can see by being disappeared from the. I saw that he just joined, right? Then what well, period? Mike, you may need to let him back in again. This is Ronnie. Ah, uh, thanks, Ronnie. Yep, I think he's coming in, coming out. I just need to keep making sure he's co-host each time. Thank you very much. There you go. Okay, he's a... Uh... Okay, 
没办法共享我的 PPT。你你下边，白冰，你这下面，嗯，有没有共享屏幕这一栏？你你这个，你 PPT 已经打开了没有 ？PPT，P 没打开。你打开，你把 PPT 打开，在电脑上打开。好，打开了以后，你再点那个共享，你就能找到它。好了好了，对对对对对，来了来了，哦，这样子，好，对对对对对，看到了吗？我们,我们正式欢迎呃白冰老师啊，这个做做演讲。好的，呃，那呃，道教大家都知道是我们中国这个唯一土生土长的一个宗教哈、啊。那么从东汉创立到现在呢，那已经有一千八百年历史。这个宗教跟跟道跟佛教还不太一样哈，它比较擅长这个呃各种宗教活动。所以说，因为因为这个原因，它这个我们现在能看到呃跟道教关系，这个实物遗存，这个考古遗存来说是非常丰富的哈。那有关这个道教实物的这个呃这种发现，应该说在宋代就有，呃，在宋代就有。呃，比如像这个像呃《历历史历序》里面就曾经呃，那么对这个呃，当时在呃天师道的，就是这个乌洞比道一些碑刻，呃，就有一种关注。那么在上个世纪五十年代、六十年代的时候呢，我们会学者呢，呃，他们比如说对曾经对呃永乐宫，呃，对这个呃，还有一些道教的事物遗存，也进行过考察和研究。不过呢，这种相对来讲是比较零星点的。那么这是道教考古材料，呃，正式引起学者关注，那是还是。不是很早的事儿，比如说像这个非常著名的学者安娜塞德尔，那么在九零年曾经提出了我们道教研究要发展，应当要跟考古跟艺术的学者进行合作。那么道教考古这个概念正式提出来是，呃，应该说还是在三十年前，我的老师张居正教授提出道教考古的构想，哎、呃，所以这个道教考古呢，总的来讲，它出来时间并不是特别长，大概有三十年历史，所以经过那么三十年的呃这么一种，呃，我们的这种探讨呃和探索了。已经识别出了若干跟道教有关系的这么些事物遗存，所以下面呢，我就呃按照这个呃 g a i 的教授的这个他的安安排的话，把这个道教考古的遗存跟大家分别的做过介绍，大体呢可以分成道教遗物，呃和道教呃这个遗迹，就是一个是可移，一个是不可可移动的，一个不可移动的那么两类。道教遗物呢，呃大概我们能识别出来，呃这个呃这个考古遗存大概考古遗物有十。十六七种的样子，那么第一种就是镜，哎、呃，这种镜可能是铜镜，可能是铁镜，呃，当道教这个在做各种斋教的时候，它它使用的镜的话，应该说是很多情况是跟一般铜镜、跟一般的镜、民间使用的镜子没什么差别哈。但是呢，有些镜子它会有些比较特殊的铭文或者一比较特殊的装饰，什么可以分辨的出来，它是一种跟道有关系的铜镜。比如说，那么像在河南，曾经发现。过一这个一个树唐墓当中啊，有这样面镜子，说里面带有比较复杂的这么些星象，还有符箓，哎、呃，又比如说像呃这一面镜子说含象镜，哎、呃，因为上面有天地含象，哎、呃，喜归这个叫做洞喜归万物洞见百灵，哎、呃，这么一边这么就十六这个铭文，哎、呃，那么是大家会大家可以发现里面这个有有这个叫做这个叫我们这个五岳，哎、呃，上面还有八卦，哎、呃，星象这些东西，说这个也是面道教铜镜。呃，这是一个韩湘镜，一个比较呃，它的一个就就是一个到了宋代的时候呢，已经是很简化的形式了。呃，这是我们国内和还有法国有收藏的这个叫五岳真形镜，呃，就是呃，它的这五岳的话，尤其是是它是正南正北正东正西，呃，那么呃，法国这边铜镜，它的它的这个五岳就放在你看的四个角，呃，就东北、东南、西北、西南。呃，这是五岳真形符，呃呃，如果研究道教的学者比较熟悉，都知道这个是也是很常见的一种一种一种一种符形哈。那么在明代又发现，在江苏的明末当中，呃，那这门铜镜是最近我从在、呃、在江西看到了哈，就在在江西鹰潭博物馆，呃，三十年前我注注意过这门铜镜，但这门铜镜现在没人做过研究，呃，那也非常复杂，这样星星象有干支。呃，哎，有有这个星象，还有这个道教的符箓，在、呃、中间还有那么这个若若干段这个铭文。这是呃，中国国家博物馆所藏的一面道教铜镜，呃，这这个时候应该是北地
北地的覆魔吧，啊，好像你们这么几个字跟道有关系的，哎，对，上面是是这个玄武。嗯，那么第二类道教这个食物呢，就是法印和令牌哈，这既有考古发掘出土，但更多呢使用我们这个市的各大博物馆呃所收藏的，呃，我们然后到。高数文献当中有很多呃关于法印的这种呃这种这种这种注录，呃，当这是一年考古处的统计，呃，考古处的这个呃这么一个印章，法印，呃，是三文将军呃,呃，在江苏的一个一个东东汉墓里面出的，呃，有趣的专注研究，呃，这是我们四川的一个博物馆，叫原岛文化博物馆，呃，里面收了一些呃这么一种道教法印，呃，有比较早的，呃，汉代的，有比较晚的，明代的。呃，这是王云成呃研究员这个在他的书当中，呃，那么收集的这种六朝时期的这些呃道教法印，呃，这是我的学生赵川，呃，他前些年在他博士论文，他就写的宋元明道教法印当中啊，所收集的这个我们这个出土的，这是武当山出土的明清时期的呃两枚这个道教法印，呃，这是令牌，呃，令牌，呃，也是道教经常要用。做法子，我们最近上用了一种一种一种一种法器，呃，这是原来博物馆所收藏的，呃，这是呃，抱歉，这个图怎么又又又又出问题了？这是呃，法国这个呃学者范华，他在湖南调查了，呃，一方面发现很大量的这道教这样一些这种神像，呃，神左神不雕的，同时他也发现了这个说这个收集了很多这样一些道教这种呃这个令牌。照相是呃，那么我们在我考古中经常碰到的一些道教的遗传哈，呃，从北朝就有，呃，然后呢，在这个唐宋时期，一直到呃宋元时期，一直到清代，都有很多这样的道教的这种这种这种神像，哎、呃，比如说这个大家非常熟悉的，就是在陕西亚翁山的，呃，所收收藏的这个翁岗这个佛的照相碑，当然关键这个碑的年代大家是有争议的，呃，现在一般认为大致应该是六世纪，公元六世纪前后。的一件这一件作品，呃，这是在成都，呃，我们的一个教堂当中出土的一个天尊像，一个天尊像，南朝时期的。呃，还有很多道教照相是分我们在楼上的这个这个时间过滤，这是在 City Museum 就是 Chicago， 呃，一一九年我去，呃，在美国的时候拍这个照片，很多我觉得好几十件，这是另外一件。那么这是墓里面出的，这雷公，这是也是个雷公，呃，是一个一个一个雷神骑在鼓上，用墓里送墓来出土的，三彩的。那么范华，呃，原法国原来叫范华，那么同样他是在这个在呃在在湖南进行调查的时候，发现了很多呃这个就是这种几千件吧，呃，这些道教神像，而且这些神像我据我所知已经到了法国，现在正在伪造北京。呃，跟北中国人民大学到后头进行整理，呃，数量非常庞大，数量非常庞大。那么这些道，呃，这些道教这个神像，它还有这个有奇迹，呃，这是其中的一件。好像我这个照片出了点问题。那么这是在呃武当山，呃，我想那各位是做道教道教的话，我想一定要去武山看一看。武当山现存各种。各类道教神像是呃一千五百件，我正在申请这么一个课题的，在对这笔材料进行整理。呃，这他们认为他们是是来最早一点，也也讲照相，但是我觉得年代可能有问题。哎，这是真武，这是张三丰，呃，明代的，呃，这这张非常非常精美，呃，有一千有各种材质，大约十六种不同材质，有金，有有这个玉，有石，有木，呃，当然还有其他不同材质，大部分都是这个上级别的文物或这个文物。那么碑刻也是我们在做考古，呃，道教考古工人经常碰到一种呃道教遗存，呃，那么这种碑刻呢，当然有早的，呃，那么这个比比较多呢，最近若干年出来这个这个道士的墓人呢很多，呃，或者今天在在线的这个像雷文教授，我就专门这个对道士墓人呢有研究。同时呢，我们国家学者呢，他们这个也是对一些某一个公观，呃，对某一个教派，比如全真，那么对某个地区，比如他们四川或云南或者上海。那么他们进来说，发现所有碑刻来进行收集整理，就出了很多成果。呃，那么前这个去年前年我去过武当山，武当山发现或者发现的地方碑刻也是是一个宝库啊。那地方这个这个这个呃，从从这个应该呃这个应该说可能从至少是元到明
，呃，到清代的碑口已经是至少不下五千件吧，呃，没有经过还没经过整理。这大家非常熟悉的大武镇肥慈碑，呃，但又学的认为它是一个这个可能年代，呃，也可能有问题，呃。这是我曾经研究过的一个简复原的石刻，呃，是一个五代的一个一个时代是年代是是五代的。这是呃在南宋时期一个非常呃大的一个到断楚复原碑，呃，后来清代呢就进行一个重刻，我的老师专门写文章进行研究，呃，这个武当山呃武隆宫的这个这个这个里面这个柱子，呃，就是李树熙，呃。他的墓葬，呃，在旁边就有摆这个大，这个很大的碑，呃，保存的很好，呃，所以如果大家有时间去武当山，那那地那地上这个碑啊是，这个就是随处都看得到，呃，一看大部分都是元代的平仄这种碑，呃，所以这个地方的碑刻，我是我是我这我觉得是那是可以这个这个有很大的这样研究的这种潜力哈。但这方面的成果非常多，呃。如果大家有兴趣，可以也可以看看这些这这么一些这种我们去国家去编的书，呃，呃，包括各个地方编的这个像，呃，山东呃出了若干本，呃，云南、上海呃出了若干本。那么另外呢，道家文物就是这么石，哎、呃，这么石，呃，这么尤其是石刻，就是砖刻，呃，那么年代也是从唐代开始就有，一直到明代都有，呃，那么这是呃。这个五金石，呃，这是三一考古院的一个研究研究员给我们留留一个一个东西，呃，还没发掉的哈，呃，五金石，因为里面提到五金这两个字儿，就是上清的东西，呃，那么这是唐中宗的定陵，呃，出土的，呃，这是五方，呃，这么石当中的中方，呃，呃，这一块非常非常精美，呃，那么它四周都是刻了这个，呃，这个十六个道教这这呃这个这佛书，那么。周周围的还有这种还刻满了这个字儿的哈，很小，跟大家不一定看得到。那这是呃，在另外这个一个墓里面出的一个一个那个五方正墓石当中的东方，哎、呃，因为五方正墓都是东南西北中五块嘛，哎、呃，这个材料也还没发表的。那这是成都出土的华盖呃公文呃这个石刻，因为中间有华盖公呃。就呃，王气什么什么这么几个字，说明一般把这个花盖公文，哎，呃，这是天子赐稿文，哎、呃，因为也是他曾有称天子赐稿这么几个字，所以叫天子赐稿文，哎、呃，这个我的老师张娟先生做非非常细致的梳理的，哎、呃，这是另外一种，呃，真人文叫八位真文，哎、呃，它叫法很多，这个这个它诗歌本身叫做什么安陵真文，哎、呃，但是文献两方面又把它叫做八位真文的，这是四川出土的，差不多就跟在。这个在宋代很多，这是消灾真文，这是一般是在我们这个是在僧人墓里面出的，呃，出这么的东西，呃，就是因为他这个墓是这个人还没死，可能是建在就放这种东西进去，呃，基本上你看这个，呃，这这边是这个道教的符书，呃，这边是呃呃这个是一段一段这个我们汉字，五方汉字，这是另外一种叫灵宝真符，五方五里灵宝真符。但这是一个收集，这是个传世品，呃，或者发发掘出土品，呃，这是考古出土的，呃，叫炼土真文，呃，几乎全是这个是这种这种这种里面这种呃这种道教这种呃云传，呃，下面这是宋代的四川发现，这是在贵州，呃，就是一个呃很有名的一个土石杨参墓里面出的，呃，这个这个呃两块呃真文石，呃，算是两个符箓，呃，用汉字变形。那么这种形成的哈，这是一个明墓来出的，在贵州明墓来出的。那么简牍呢，也是我们经常碰到的一种，呃，跟道教关系的这种，呃，这种考古遗存，呃，比较早的呢，就是在呃江苏，呃，这个东汉一个遗址呢出的，呃，这是一个符，这个符的这个一个一个方大的这个状况，呃那这是这个名次，就是我们现在说的名片，哎，这是专门做研究的，哎，所以你看这边，他自称自己是个道士，正走在拜，有些甚至是孔子，不叫弟子，我认为这是这是道教的一种遗传。那么还有就是，呃，大家都非常熟悉的这个叫做在，呃，现在在在，应该是在香港中文大学，呃，是在甘肃出的一个一个简，松人简中部读，呃，那么是，呃，这个你看这个目读的这个，呃，两面都有文字。呃，是彩这个彩绘的墨书，哎、呃，这是呃我们前些年在江苏扬州
跟大家都知道，哎，某呃挖到一个叫做呃南关地址康州的一个一个墓葬，那么里面就出了这个呃这个叫做杜公版。呃，但这个杜公版很很可惜的，它残掉了一部分。呃，但是总体还算比较完整。那么我们好的学者就对这个进行研究。哎，买地券是另外一种，哎，到叫呃，考古中间的碰到的这种遗存。那么这种买地券呢，呃，里面它是有生墓券，我丈母娘只能说生墓券就是它是没死，就变成一件墓葬。呃，那么放放一些东西进去，要放一块就是带文字东西进去。丈母娘是人人死的时候呢。那么才放进去的，和它放的时间还不太一样。那么这个里面当不是纯粹的是道家的东西，哎，但是里面有哎相当浓厚的道家色彩。我们看一下这块生墓券，哎，在四川成都出土的五代这个生墓券，哎，因为它特别提到这个地方，它是它是它是建寿冢、建寿堂，哎，但是呢都很少这种这种这种这种生墓券很少，更多还是像这种葬墓券比较多。这是在呃在。湖北武汉处理的一个南朝刘记的买地券，哎，那么最后还附了一个很一个一个一个大的符箓，哎，这个里面非常浓的道德色彩，这是比较更多一点啊。那这是一种侯图地卷，呃呃，所以这种用呃呃，这是一个一是生墓，呃，这是在这个在贵州，呃，这个波波州杨氏的一个就是墓里面出的，哎，他给我们说的是，简，呃，我看看哈，呃。寿堂，哎，这寿堂，哎，这明明明说明显它也是也是一个一个生墓，哎，那这是在重庆出的。那么从明代开始呢，买地方还有一个特点，它就是它既正面有文字，背面也有文字，哎，正面我们会发现呢，它有很浓厚的道家色彩，哎，太上五帝生辰，女性都立立立。那么背文它还有背文，天文地方，哎，立立九章，有背文，而且呢，你看四周还有这个。呃，还有这个叫八卦，八卦。那么关于呃，像这种百地卷前面说的这个问题呢，呃，我们这个都在中国道教考古当中有若干篇，呃，都做过非常好的研究，呃，大家有兴趣可以看。呃，那么在成都这个二零一二年出本书，呃，里面也收了这个这个呃，这个四百多件，呃，这个叫带文字的东西，其中很多也都是这种百地卷，这是百地卷。大家头文件。那么铜人节呢？呃，在我们呃好好几个省份都有出土哈，呃都有都有都有发现。那么年早的可以到唐代，晚的可以到明代。呃，我们这样这个就中外学者同时做过研究，呃，包括我们上次在呃呃大唐茅师开会的时候呢，那么这个呃葛思康也做过非常好的研究。哎、呃，那么像这个是唐宣宗时期呃南越的一个铜人节啊。那就是还有这个五代，呃，在这个在浙江，呃，也发现了若干，呃，吴越国时期的这种头文件。那么这是在武当山，呃，这个它是完整的一套，呃，既有这个金龙，呃，有有玉璧，呃，有这个，呃，这个玉，这个这个石简，哎，还有陶瓷器。那么这个陶瓷器呢？呃，它这个呃，更多想能看到的是这个的，呃，汉晋时期、汉晋十六国时期啊，呃，这种带有文字的竹书、墨书的这种陶瓶啊。那么在烧碗的时候，有一些呃，这个大大概是宋代的时候，一些这种瓷碗里面带符箓，呃，同时也像官窑瓷器，在青花当中有带道教这些符文的，带带道教这些这种就这种纹饰的纹样的这么一些青花瓷器。那么这就是在呃陕西呃，在这个。呃，在河南，呃，发现了这些，有些是瓶，有些是罐子，哎、呃，那么这瓶，这瓶呢，它这个有些是朱书来书写的哈。那么你像这种就是，呃，这是罐，这是这是个瓶，呃，这是个罐，这是个瓶，也是朱书，哎、呃，那么这是这个斗瓶，呃，就是在甘肃年代稍晚点，它算很小，就是几公分的样子，有墨书，有墨书，那么。还有一种就是把它是叫简竹钵，是一个碗的形状的哈，哎，把它这个西满这个就是简竹文，然后呢，它是把需要把它砸碎，那么撒在这个死者的这个他的这头部或者脚身上的，前面也不是完整的，这个会把它砸砸碎。这是宋代的这个带带符箓的这个瓷碗，哎，在在这个现在的元元道这个文化博物馆。我抱歉，这个呃，这个是引出去香港中文大学教那个教授，他呃，就专门就是对，呃，这个就是说以官窑瓷器当中带一些这种呃八卦或者带一些先后呃这样一些呃这种青花瓷的研究，呃，我这杂志出了问题。
，那就是呃各种这个人形的东西，呃，这个呃在呃汉墓里面，在这个历史的唐墓中都出现，呃，比如像这个就是，呃，那那就是在陕西，呃，一个东汉墓里出的一个千人，呃，很逼真。那这是在这个一个衙墓里面，在四川，呃，里面出的这个千人，连结千人，呃，这是这是这个是在。云南，呃，也东汉末年出，东汉的这专属的出的一些，呃，金人和这个这个，呃，叫千人，呃，这是白人，呃，这是今天可能在线上的，呃，我的学生赵川博士专门做研究的，就是就是白人，呃，发现的比较多。那墓主像，呃，墓主像，墓主像呢，呃，这个墓像大家都非常熟悉，呃，那就是这个王建墓，呃，称之先祖王建墓，呃，属他的这个石像。那么同时还有比较多的这些墓葬当中，又像这种呃放的这种呃可能是石的，可能是陶的，可能三彩的这么坐像，呃墓中像，呃也是跟道教有关系的。那就钱币，呃钱币呢，呃那么这个有部分钱币跟道教关系比较密切，比如说像这个说压岁钱哈，这个压岁钱，那么这两枚压岁钱，呃里面就有符箓，有星象，有星象。呃，但年代，我想这个可能还需要再做研究。那么像这个在呃宋墓当中，呃，那么钱给他腰坑，宋墓的这个有有一个墓在四川的安定墓的腰坑，就用这钱币，有大概将近三百枚吧，摆成这八卦、洛书呃这种形状。呃，这是当时他们这个展览的时候一个张照片。哎、呃，这是我的老师张轩先生，他做这个复原，他认为甚至是用一三五清九，呃，这是那种洛书，哎、呃，就是八卦，呃，这样，他是他认为是是。是摆的是这样一种，就是一种这个图案，哎，那这是另外一个墓葬，是用这个钱币摆成的，在腰坑当中摆成千秋万岁，呃，这么一种字样。那么这是在明墓，哎、呃，在江西的明墓当中啊，他是在他的呃棺台上啊，呃，用这个，你看他是七，这个就是说这个是呃有七个孔，那、呃、那中间的是镶嵌的这个呃若干枚这种钱币，呃、摆成北斗七星这种形状，哎、呃，孔里面是镶嵌钱币的，有一次，尤其是有一次一般的冥币，有一些可能是一种比较。透支的一种金币，所以关于这个关于这个钱币的问题，但这个呃，我们川大有一位呃研究生专门写过一篇博士论文、硕士论文，叫《亚生钱》一个呃一个研究，有兴趣大家可以找来看一看。那就另外一种就是这个呃跟道有关系的这样考古呃这种遗物，就是明洞录影，也是通行证的，呃，这就是在在江西的明洞当中发现的。四川也有，呃，这种东西在现在都还还有发现，初步还发现。说你看它到底是三种口，它有九天尊，呃，像是三天佛教，呃，这个复原体套大法师，呃，大法天师张怎么怎么啊？这个道教这里分，我我我的老师张轩先生专门做过研究的。那就朱书版瓦，哎、呃，朱书版这是我在河南，呃，进行考古发掘，那么挖到的，哎、呃，那么这是他这个我们进行处理，上就它是一个道教的符箓，道教的符箓，哎、呃。还还不太一样，哎。那么另外一种呃道教呃是以这个这个考古的实物，就是道教的服饰。我们呢有些种墓葬中曾经发现过道士这个道士的呃这样一些这个不完整的道士的这种所谓他的这个服装。那么同时呢，我们在呃道教造型当中有也有这个这个我们的很多道士就穿的是道袍哈，呃，那么在道教标当中也有跟道教服饰有关系的。那么这些实物，说诸如此，我们都是值得研究的。这是在元道博物馆。那所收藏的一套道教服饰，那道教的黄龙画，哎，那么但佛教有它的水的画哈，但是道教也有它自己的黄龙画。那么黄龙画年代不是特别早，哎，都是相对比较偏晚一点的，哎，在我们很多地方都有发现。比如说，像包括像这个这个照片也也出了问题，哎，在这个，哎，就是，呃，就是博一教授给我的一本书哈，就是在，呃，北京白云观所藏的这个水的画，他们全部出版了哈。呃，这个是叫做名字我一下记不住哈，这是其中的这个他们的水的话非常非常精美，呃，呃，就是北斗这南斗，那就是在甘肃维博物馆，哎、呃，他们所收藏的水的话，呃，这个是那、就是三清，那这是元道文化博物馆所收藏的水的话，呃，叫这个是李远国呃教授他所收藏的，现在已经呃交给师范大学，呃，他们正在进行合作进行整理。有好几千张，哎、呃，但是跟道教关系的东西没那么多，也少一些。那么，呃，对这个水陆神拳，哎、呃，就是我们北京白云观他们把他们收藏的水的话，哎、呃，出了很厚的书，哎、呃，非常精精美，好几公斤，哎、呃
，但我的学生杜康的话，曾经也是对，呃，成都博物馆收藏了很多书的话，呃，这个当然主要是佛教有有大概佛教道教一万多张，呃，道教可能只是一部分，说他就专门针对当中选了这个一六十多张出来，后来写的这样东西来，也很不错的。但其他我们觉得跟道有关系的东西，可能还有丹药，还有还有一些这种，还有跟炼丹有关系，或者装丹药、装成丹有关系的一些器具用具，哎，这个三关系我就不多讲了，哎，这是遗物。那么遗迹呢，哎，相对少一些。遗迹当中，有一类跟道教高位关系比较密切，就是说道教的公观。这些公观呢，哎，有些人还保存地面上，哎，年代还还还比较早，有唐代的哈。那么，呃，比如像河北、福建、在江西、山西都曾经做过这个调查，包括武当山，那在这个时候，那所以在我们现在是很多这个清这个这个这个明明代的这些这些道教建筑，刚完整保存现在，保存在地下的呢，呃，很多将已经是地面建筑完全毁坏了，哎，这个这个就说这种就就它的这个建筑基础还在，哎，那么这些建这些道教公馆呢？那么也有一部分进行过发掘，比如说九零年，呃，对都江堰的一个建筑工就进行过发掘，呃，当时放这个藏殿的遗址进行过发掘。那么后来在河南也曾经挖过这个呃太清宫，作为太清宫，但现在资料还没发表。那么这个武当山呢是有三个宫观进行发掘，呃，一个是玉真宫，呃，一个是回龙观，一个是武龙宫。武龙宫现在正在发掘，就是由湖北省文化考古研究所跟师范大学还有其他单位合作，正在挖武龙宫。那么大三清宫大家都非常熟悉，就前些年他们是做过发掘的。这是武当山，哎、呃，所以就九宫八观的一个图，一个图。那么，哎、呃，这个玉真宫是做过发掘的，哎、呃，这个回龙观也是做过发掘，哎、呃，现在正在挖，哎、呃，这个地方就是这个叫做武龙宫，叫挖武龙宫。武当山这个玉真宫的，呃，报告已经出版了，大家呃有兴趣可以找来看一看，哎、呃。那这是呃一九年发表这个发掘的这个回龙观遗址，我的学生今年刚刚以呃这个公馆的建筑呃为主题的完成他的硕士论文，呃写的还不错的。那这是武武龙宫，呃这是呃面积是二十万平方米，呃现在正在他的这个呃这个方向哈，呃说他的日食数理是这个方向在做发掘，出了很多东西，有很多这个就是这种呃照相，有有有碑刻出一些这种。这个呃，这个我还没去，最近我想去看一看。呃，他们是呃，哦、挖发掘面积是八千平方米，这是呃已经发掘结束的这个英坦的大三清宫遗址。呃，这个也是这个全国的十大考古发现。模样照相也是我们在考古、考古道教考古过程经常碰到的一类呃这种呃实物，也是最近若干年我在关注的一个重点哈。但这些道教照相，在做李松教授，呃，他喜欢，呃，做过专门做过研究，是比较早是在北朝，呃，时期啊，在陕西，呃，有几处这个就是不多，两三处这样一些模样照相。那么四川的后来有发现在，在呃建构有发现，哎、呃，这个东西数量都不多，但是呢，数量更多还是到了隋，到了唐宋时期啊，就集中分布咱们四川了。呃，四川，根据我们的统计，有这个有将近三百处，呃，这样一些，这个就是这种这种这种，呃。这个就是这个东西，石，这个就是模样照相也少数的石窟。那么，虽然我在石中也不少，哎、呃，就有，呃，这个就有一百多处，哎、呃，我们可以看一下，这个在四川建构，呃，他们这个新县城的一个一个河边上发现的一个西魏时期的道教照相，一个模样照相，资料还没发表，啊、呃，这是他的一个细部。这是风格跟跟这个跟陕西非常这个相似，跟陕西这个跟关中地区发展也很相似。那这就是我们从一一年开始，十年前开始一直在做的，呃，这个就是这种，呃，就做道道教考古的调查哈，从大概做了五六十个地点哈，这我这么做的第一个地点也是就是玄庙观，这它第一龛，哎、呃，这是个老君，哎、呃，它的祖宗是老君，它很复杂，这是我们对它进行一个测绘那个线图，哎、呃，但是线图还，呃，这我们的、这个，因为这个屏幕太小，看的不是很清晰，图本身画的很大的，这到了第二龛就有这个说这个四个天尊，哎、呃。四个天尊保存也比较好的，这是什么？他的画的，他的一个线图，一个线图。那这是他的第六龛，哎，这是个佛道合龛，佛道合龛，这他的线图，哎，这个是，呃，右边这个，呃，是这个道像，呃，这边这个佛像。这是刚才这个 Gail 他提到的哈，就是人手唐僧岩，我们做了这个测绘，呃，正在编写报告，我们希望看明明年能不能出版。
，呃，这个我们算认为应当就是三十二，就是刚好是三十二个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个就是说道家就是道神，应该是三十二天，哎，让三十二天尊，三十二天尊，这他的一个侧面，我估计来不及放这个我们的这个线图，线图都有的，这是。很有名的这个这个三宝龛，哎，李松先生专门做过研究的哈，就他的正正面的那张照片，这是他的这个呃左臂，哎、呃，这左臂的一个就是他的一个踏片，哎、呃，这个这这里保存的很好，哎、呃，我的一个学生后来专登红药，我是专门对这个进行过研究，哎、呃，进行过研究，那是他的右臂，这是他左臂的情况，嗯、呃，那么。这种道家的这种照相啊，实际上在呃这个就是宋代，当在大处非常多，呃，然后呢，呃，到明代到清代，一路一路还还有这个数量还不少。比如这个就是在注意呢，呃，考古工作者在重庆江津的曹元观，呃，他们这个呃做了一个调查，就呃发现这个三清像，过去认为是宋代，后来曾经认为是明代，现在看见的应该是个清代的一个三清，一个三清，那还是很精美的，上面有七环，有七口。这是他的这个呃，这个三清的左卫臂，他这个叫呃五老五七天君，还有是五岳，就是五岳，哎、呃，这是算是清代的呃这个道教照中很精的一个东西。所以我们现在这个四川地区三个道教照相最集中的地点哈，呃，玄面观这个报告，我们觉得这个道教都集中，我们正在呃出版工当中。然后唐僧演和当年龙虎山呢，我们正在编撰，真希望在这边写那个出版。那么今年呢，我的一个博士邓红亚，他刚刚也是四川地区宋代以前道教照相。呃，研究为题的文章的博士呢，我很厚，写的这个有这个三十多万字，呃，解决了很多，我觉得这个还是很大的推动，对过去我们对道玄认识啊，应该说还有很大的提升。壁画是另外一种经常碰到的这种遗，这个就是说这种道教呃这种遗迹哈。那么这种壁画，我想大家都非常熟悉的，就是在加拿大的一个博物馆藏的，有三幅元代的道教壁画，但最知名就是山西瑞城的永乐宫，呃。那么里面这个道家壁画，那是非常非常精美，也可以说代表中国道家壁画的最高水平的一个东西。除此之外，呢，还有一些墓葬的壁画，还有一些墓葬壁画。那这就是我们这个呃永乐宫这个壁画，呃，非常非常精美。这是在呃，这是墓葬壁画，就是江江西的一个宋墓，呃，一个戴资在这个道士的墓里面，那么是是现刻的。这是另外一个壁。这是山西大同冯道珍，呃，就是这个葛思康，呃，呃，前年在四川大学开我们这个道教考古会的时候呢，专门研究过这个这个这个、这个这个墓葬，里面也有这个这个这个壁画。所以大家如果对这个永乐宫有兴趣的，可以去看这两本书。呃，而当这个像这个除了呃前面提了九仙之外的话，像这个景安陵，那么也是对永乐宫的壁画做很深入研究。呃，三观性别我就不用多说。但就是道士墓，那么道士墓呢？呃，这个是从宋，是应该说在六朝时期就有呃发现、呃。那么到这个呃宋代，呃，买唐代很快，唐代这个就是像对也有这个唐代像道士墓发现了，在在这个这个陕西发现很多道道士的墓志铭，说证明的话可能很多道士墓的。呃，那么这个宋代的道士墓，呃，我的学生呃杜康呃专门做过研究，嗯、呃，对这个山西的这个道士墓呢。金元时期到什么？我我本人是写文章做过研究的哈，所以一直在像这种到什么到这个到到明代也都还有发现，因为都都作为一种身份很特殊这些墓葬。那么他们这个就说这个他们的墓葬的选择、建的这种墓葬材质，包括他们的方向里面这样一些里面的随葬品是吧？它有一些特点，我想是需要关注、需要做研究的。那么除了这两种，就是说我们说遗迹遗物之外呢，我想有几种图录，呃，也许大家熟悉啊。还是跟你想大家介绍一下，就是它里面可能涵盖的东西，呃，既有遗迹，有遗物，大家可以可以关注一下。你们可以做研究的时候，我们像这个里面可以找到很多我们遗迹感兴趣的材料，比如像在九九年在台湾，呃，做这个做这个展览叫《道教文物展》，也出了本这个图录叫《道教文物》，里面展出了这个呃，我五百多年这个道教文物，呃，那就是在香港中文大学零八年的时候呢，呃，做过一个呃，说在以道场这么一个展览哈。那么是展出了这个道教的文物，有将近一百件，也出过这么一个图录。那就是在法，在这个台湾，在这个一三年，呃，是李丰茂呃教授，呃，他们的就是他和他的学生，呃，他的学生，呃，收藏文物呢，做了个展览，叫《道海道法海涵》，呃，那么展出的文物也不少。
，那那就是呃，大家的分数今年两千年在芝加哥呃做一个道教的这个展览，哎，那么这个影响到轰动的展览就是，呃，那么是征集了呃调用的文物，呃，从全世界有一百五十多件。那么零九年在日本也做过一个这个这个一个一个一个道教美术这个巡回展，哎，收集了这个道教文物是四百一十三件。那这个是法国，也就是大家非常熟悉的这个，在吉米博物馆做一个展览，呃，从全世界征调了两百五十多件文物，呃，做了个展览。你们涉及到的，呃，这样实物的总结非常非常多，就非常多。前面提到很多实物，呃，这里面都有收入，呃，就是讲这这个数据是这个样子，呃，那么最近呢，我想，哦，对对，像韩国哈，韩国也做过一个道教这个这个展览，呃，在在这个。后来出了一个图录，这是个韩国的学生后来后来那么专门给我的。那么我想最后还提出就是我们这个呃最近的中国学者编的本书，呃呃就是两年前刚出版的这个书非常非常昂贵，呃是十六万人民币吧，叫《中国道教版画全集》，呃那么是根据五百多种文献编出来的，收的这个呃从宋代到民国时期的道教版画有三万多幅，呃就是就是这样子一百本一百本。那么这一百本呢，呃，这个呃，它看起来收入层面是非常非常丰富的，它丰富的。我想，这个如果我们这个有这个书在世吧，可能对我们识别以后，很多我们考古发现这些道教间隙，呃，就说不管是我们的道教的造像、道教间隙石窟，呃，有道教的博雅造像，还是那些道教间隙绘画，哎、呃，我想都是很有价值的，哎、呃，这是这个这个书的一个以及呃，大概的每它基本上的时代来收入的。呃，我不知道现在美国的学者能看到我们这本书啊，这本书，呃，我觉得是非常有价值的。哎、呃，大概我就讲这么多吧。呃，就是说这个关于道教，呃，这个实物道教这个考古材料，大概是分类的问题，我就大概讲这样多。好，谢谢各位。好，谢谢呃，白冰教授。OK， so now the 呃、uh, ，the floor is open， so。Uh, any questions? If if uh, any questions are welcome, and uh, any question to to gear uh, to gear and uh, Baibing, uh, welcome. I I still have another presentation. Oh, you you have another presentation? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I I thought. Okay. Uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> The, the the final section of presentation uh, is 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 is, is presented by 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 uh, Gail as yeah. well. I'll be I'll be I'll be I'll be short. Okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this this was a, an, an 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 amazing presentation by by being showing you how rich and vast um, the materials are. So what I'm going to do is sort of do the opposite. Um, I'll, I'll really focus just on a single um, artifact. And do a very close reading of it, um, and try to and try to show how um, using this particular artifact um, we can sort of augment the text we have, but also vice versa, maybe use the text to understand what what the people who put up this artifact um, were doing. So I'm I'm going to look very just really just one example at this stele from um, it's it's in the, in the Xi in Xi'an Beilin. Um, it's called the Tianlian Quan Stili. Um, it's a four-sided stili. Um, just, just as we start, I just want to explain when, when we talk about stilis, um, one, once we decide which is the front side, um, in this case, this is the front side, this, this would be the yang or nan side, um, then it's left and right of the main image. So this is the front, um, this is the left. Right, and behind that would be the back face, and on this side would be the right face. Right, so that's the way we discuss these stilis. And this particular stili, um, I picked for a number of reasons, um, um, partially because it's just one of the best kept ones, and also because the text is really, really an interesting text. Um, unlike uh, many other stilis, we don't really have a date on this stili. Most, most, most of the voting descriptions have dates as well as an original location. This one is missing um, that. So um, using stylistic um, um, sort of uh, st st stylistic um, considerations, uh, Li Song dates this to about 504 to maybe 515. Hu Wenhe, which actually labels this Simian Xiangbei, um, labels it um, 
dates a little bit later. Um, I usually take Lee Sung's um, dating as more, more, more effective. So this, again, so this is the front side of the stele. All right, so again, this is the front. Um, you can see here um, <clears throat> in, the, in the central niche is an image of, of Lord Lao. We know it's Lord Lao because he's because he's he's wearing a Chinese style dress. He's got a, a sort of a Dao a Taoist cap, and he's holding um, uh, this thing in his hand, which might be a, sam a, a sambal, um, um, one one of those sam sambal whips. Um, and on on his two sides, you can see um, his um, aides, and, and they're holding. Um, you can see it closer here, um, sort of the Taoist um, um, huban. Um, for which I now forget what an English word for that is. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's, so, so let me just go back to where we were. Um, he sit, he sit inside sort of a chamber and if you imagine, this is sort of the imagining here, um, the housing in which Lord Lao actually dwells, right? Um, with some kind of strange beast on the top. Below the main image are, um, the sensor, the main sensor. Um, here you have the master of the, the master of of the e of the committee, Yi Shi, and it's a Tianlan Quan, right? So the so the stele is named by this person who supposedly is the main donor of the stele. So when you look at these steles and you read their names, very often it's named by the person identified as the main donor. Um, Sometimes there's some dispute who the main donor is. But in this particular case, everyone agrees, not necessarily that he's the main donor, but it's a very useful term um, name to use. What you also have here are numerous Dao Shi and Dao Min. All right, so they're, they, they self identify as Taoists of various ranks. Um, we also have their imagery. I'll show you a little bit in the close up in, 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 a, in a minute. Um, so we can use these steels also to sort of examine. Um, the vestments and the shapes and the hats and so on of, of um, the Taoists of, of the period. This is the rear face. Um, I apologize for this photo because these, these steles are fixed um, in place at, at Xi'an Berlin. It's very, very difficult to get good photos of the back faces. Um, this, this is the, in the moment I'll show you a little bit clearer, um, is the Buddhist face at the rear, all right? So this is again the front niche. And you can see a little bit closer now what Lord Lao is imagined to look like. Um, with his long ears, he's got um, a central sort of node here, which of course is um, an, 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 an iconographic um, characteristic that's picked up from the Buddha. And, in, and um, you can see, although um, it's not quite moved into sort of the Taoist imagination fully, the iconography at this stage is still based very much on, on, on Buddhist models. This is the Buddha um, on the other side. You can see um, a very different sort of the, the, the robe, the flowing robe um, and the Ushnisha at the top. Um, and he's sitting in a Wu Wei mudra, the no fear uh, mudra. <clears throat> this again, so this is the central, um, the bottom part of, of the front face. And again, you can sort of see the robes that are being worn here. Um, there's quite a bit of work people have been doing in trying to figure out different styles of sensors um, and, and if they have any significance um, between them. There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a group of, of, of steelies that seem to illustrate sort of more, slightly more triangular kind of sensors. And there's assumptions that there might be some Zoroastrian um, input on that. Um, this is the right face of the stele. <clears throat> All right, so it's a it's a it's a it's a Buddha seated here, and again on his face there's also um, his own his own um, sensor. So that, so so what we're imagining here are sort of two separate, perhaps two separate units within the same community. Taoists and Buddhists are making offerings to the Buddha and to Lord Lao, so at the same time and yet somehow separate. Um, these are the Buddhist monks, which are, are of course dressed as monks, very different than a Taoist we saw on, on the other face. And I think there's a lot of research that's interesting to sort of make, sort of compare these different styles um, of clothing and so on. Um, <clears throat> the left face, which you, the one we'll be concerned with most, um, again, it's a, it's a Taoist face, but in this case, as you can see, Lord Lao 
is now sitting in a Wu Wei mudra. So here is adopted, in fact, the, the Buddha, the Buddha uh, mudra. And this is the face that will be concerned us because this is the one that has the inscription, the votive inscription, which I want to spend some time um, working through. Again, you have here um, above it, you have a variety of Daomin. Um, and, uh, and so, I'm not gonna get into this um, here, but there's, there's numerous, numerous ranks and styles of names um, on these steelies. And there's a lot of room for all kinds of um, um, tracing the various uh, ranks, um, um, uh, initiations, ordinations of the Taoists uh, and the various people on, on the steelies, as well as doing a, a lot of social history, trying to sort of link all these various people. What's very clear here that all of these Dao, meaning Dao, they're, they're all surnamed Tian. So this is very clearly a, a family, um, one, one particular family who's, who's putting up um, uh, this particular stele. Again, some of the steles are put up by single families and some steles are put up by, 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 a variety, by groups of families. Uh, we also have many steles which are by non-Han people, um, which is also um, something that I can't get into today. But so it's just interesting to note that um, while we tend to think of non-Han people as um, tending to be more Buddhist, a lot, a lot of these things are evidence that many of them were in fact Taoists. <clears throat> so what I wanna spend some time on now is actually uh, looking at the votive inscription and trying to make sense of it and seeing how we can um, read it. So this is the rubbing of the text. Um, <clears throat> And what I have here are two transcriptions, one by Li Song and one by uh, uh, Wei Hong Li from 2017. Um, and you can see the sum, well, everyone agrees about the first line that the, the, the 45 members of the community put up this, the, the statue. Once you get into the, into the next five lines, this, there's quite a bit of disagreement on, what, on how to read and punctuate um, uh, you know, these, these, these graphs, but more so, even if we, there's really no explanation of what it might actually mean. So what I'm gonna do now is, is read these um, in conjunction with Lingbao scriptures. And what I'm gonna, I'm gonna show is that once you get into the Lingbao scriptures, first of all, some of these um, debates become much, much clearer. You can actually decide what is correct reading, but also you get a far richer sense of, um, of what the text actually says. And the point here is not so much to correct the text by reading the scriptures. The point is really to show that these, the people who are writing these texts, these body inscriptions in Northern China in the early sixth century had access to the Southern texts of the Lingbao tradition, did to many texts. They read them very carefully. They used them um, in interesting ways, not necessarily the way we would necessarily read or use these texts. Um, but it, but it, it does mean that there were transmission networks um, going from south to the north, and that and and and, and that this community had access to these Lingbao scriptures, including ones that we don't even have anymore. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so one of the reasons I'd actually picked this particular stele is, in fact, because it has the word uh, uh, Dao Um uh, the, the, you know, Taoism. Um, and one of the questions we might want to ask is what, what, you know, what that actually means. In general, um, the significance um, is, before we get, get started, is the significance of, of this, of this um, uh, inscription is that it, it's really very clearly, you'll see in a minute, um, it's about Lingbao, this Lingbao salvation hopes. Right. Um, the first wish is that the, se that the seven ancestral generations will ascend to the blessed halls in the heavens and that all the living members of the family will enjoy favor on earth. Um, and after death, having completed the study of the Tao, they'll be refined in the Vermilion Mound and roam free the golden towers. That's what he says here. But let's look a little bit at what the text actually says. And the first thing I want to really look at is, is, the, is Tao Jiao, which we, which we think we know what it means, but do we actually know what it means? Um, so if we look at some of the early examples um, from other steles, this is the very famous Yabodwo stele from 496. <clears throat> um, and it's a very, very long inscription. 
but this is just you know a small part of it. And I want I want to first of all to, to look at some of the phrasing because um, this 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 is very typical of um, the way that the stilis talk about this, but also the way that Buddhists begin to talk about their own statues. Right, the great Tao is hidden and it's dark. Uh, it trusts itself to form. Um, the numerous teaching is subtle, and so on. Here we have the perfect script extends with the Brahma, right? Uh, we find this is this, of course, is the title of Shishuwei's book. Um, but of course, this 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 is a, a, a Ling Bao adaptation of Buddhist terminology, right? So whoever is putting up this description is is using this this terminology. Um, and yet, although it's, although it, it is um, a Ling Bao text, it it really celebrates the or celebrates um, Lao Tzu, right? Lao Tzu's teaching is labeled Xuan Jiao, right? And here comes the critical problem, all right? In the present age, we're told something <laughs> Dao Jiao fun. And does this Dao Jiao refer to Taoism or not? What does the, what does this Dao Jiao refer to? Does it refer to the same Dao Jiao? that this Dao Jiao refers to or not. It seems to imply that in fact, this is a much wider range of categories, including actually uh, Buddhism and not necessarily what we think of today as Dao Jiao. The problem becomes uh, a little bit more complicated um, when we look at, a, at another um, stele from 488. Uh, this is again from, Shang, again from the same region um, Tang Chang Gong, so Lord Tang Chang who puts up this 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 inscription um, in in building um, the Hui Fu. So this is a Buddhist temple dedicated to um, um, Emperor Emperor Wenming and 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 his grandmother actually. And first of all, I want you to to notice the opening phrasing here. Um, so although this is a Buddhist stele, it's very clearly using the same terminology as the Taoist materials. Um, <clears throat> Here we have a construct, construct, continuous construction of where Dao and Fa are being somehow um, uh, compared. And we have here at the end, uh, we, we're, we're told that the emperor <clears throat> um, somehow is, is, is revering both what was called the Shu Zong, so the teaching of emptiness, but also upholding something called Dao Jiao. Now, is this Dao Jiao the same as this Dao Jiao and the same as this Dao Jiao? Um, I, th I think at this point, it's very, very difficult to sort of adjudicate this. Uh, we know that the word Dao Jiao really only comes into, into to mean something like what we call Taoism at the very end of, of, of the fifth century. So really at the time that these still are being put up. Um, is this person who's, who's writing this text for the imperial, um, for this temple built for the, for the, for the imperial uh, uh, person, are they doing something together? That's Buddhism and Taoism together, or are they comparing two types uh, of Buddhism? So Chinese scholars generally tend to take this Dao Jiao to mean some form of Buddhism. I tend to not agree with that. Um, it seems to me that the separate ways that they're discussing here are the same as the separate ways being discussed here. And in fact, it goes back to some of the Taoist writings in which they distinguish between Buddhism and Taoism separate ways um, that need to be distinguished and yet somehow um, um, subservient to a, a high realm of Tao itself. So this is Tao Jia. So here I think Tao Jia might actually mean what we think, right? Dao Jiao does seem to me something like Taoism in our sense. The teaching of the Tao will, um, will flourish. All right, so that's one thing that we can begin with just to sort of think really very carefully about the terminology we use and whether Dao Jiao means what we think it means or if it means something else. And when we say the words of the Tao, you know, Shi Dao, is that the same as this Shi Dao, All right? So we have a lot of problematic terminology here that's moving between Buddhist and Taoist um, um, valiances. All right, so, but uh, now I wanna, I wanna go back and, and look at some of the lines that are a li li little bit more problematic. I wanna start with line number five, um, and particularly what we song, uh, this, this line here. Um, um, sorry. This line here. Um, 
this character in particular is a problem. Is it Jung or is it Zhu, as Le uh, Hong says? All right, so this is so, so perhaps this is the line here, okay? Uh, having completed their study of the Tao, they'll be refined in Vermilion Mound and Rome Free. It must be Zhu Ling. Right, not Yongling. Juling is a very important um, location in um, sort of the Lingbao um, uh, sort of uh, cosmography. Um, the scripture of salvation, so the, the number one text in, in the Taoist canon, one of the most important Lingbao scriptures, uh, refers to the transcendent location in you know many, many times. Um, sometimes somebody calls it as Zhu Guan, uh, sometimes it's Nan Guan, um, or, or generally is Juling. So these are all sort of synonymous, right? And the significance of this, this kind of red location, this is where the souls of the dead who have, who have attained or, or real about it, attained a Tao, this is an alchemical um, metaphor. So this red location, whatever it's labeled is where they are uh, recycled and refined, right? So once it's, the Durenjing is recited 10 times, um, they will all ascend up, they'll be inscribed um, to the Vermilion Palace, um, they'll be transformed and they'll be reborn um, and they'll contain, and then they'll finally ascend to the Golden Towers, right? So this is where this line is probably coming from, something from very similar to this passage. You can see something very, very similar uh, further on in the same text. Um, the seven generations um, will ascend, um, they'll, they'll be depart and then um, their hun will, will go through the, the Vermilion Mount um, and then be reborn. Right. <clears throat> and then I want you to pay attention to this final quote here. This is from a text um, called um, the Duran Ben Xing Jing. Um, this, this, is, this is one of the original Lingba scriptures. It's no longer extant. It's no longer extant in the canon. It's only, um, we have fragments from in, in verse encyclopedias and, and we have um, a few Dunhuang manuscripts. But, but I really want to pay attention to this one. Um, so this is, um, this, this whole text is kind of a series of Jalaka tales of, of previous births, of previous lives of the high gods of our current world. So this particular one is of, of Qingling, um, Xie Lao Jun. So, you know, what a long story, um, but at some point um, as his path in his previous life was almost complete. He was inscribed at, at the fire um, bureau of the Zuling, of the Vermilion Mount. Um, and his that was almost complete. After that is another rebirth. But I wanted to remember this text because this text might be very important for us understanding of some other parts of, of this inscription. Um, <clears throat> just similar phrasing to the Xiao Yao, which of course is you know from Zhuangzi, but it's the way it's used in the Taoist text here. This is when when you attain um, beyond rebirth, actually. So you roam at the golden at the golden um, um, uh, at, the, at the golden pylons or golden towers, this is the, the, one of the preeminent cosmographic locations in both the Shangqing and Lingbao scriptures. Um, and this really beautiful um, stili, um, this is actually from, from uh, Rui Chang. Uh, we, again, we have Xiao Yao Wei. Um, so again, the, the Linghun, um, they, they ascend and they transform, they become, and they roam in the transcendent um, courts. And finally, they um, roam freely at Wu Wei. Um, Again, Wu Wei uh, literally means, of course, non-action, but in many Taoist texts of the period, it's actually a synonym for Nirvana. So we have to always sort of think um, what what exactly are the words that are being used and what are the connotations for the for for the authors. Um, again, Lord Lao here in the center. Another one of the of the of the debates we had was line number six. Um, you can see um, Li Song has is Chuan Zhu. Uh, this is this is this line here, the very top of of, of, of line six. Um, Wei Hong Li has um, Chuan Hua, and there's some kind of indecision about this graph here. This is line six. <clears throat> All right, um, Chuan Zhu is it's this is a really critical term. Um, in ethical, uh, sort of in the ethical system developed in, in, in the Lingbao scriptures. Uh, one of the key texts uh, for, this, for, for this is um, this text here, um, 
about um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the high priest, the great precepts of, of great wisdom of, from the Lingba scriptures. And then it lists 10 superior precepts of wisdom and goodness to encourage and aid uh, uh, Chuan All right, And this, this list is repeated in many, many, many texts, but it's, this is sort of the original list from this particular text here. And I think number nine is particularly useful for us. Um, as you can see here, uh, so I think, I think the character that's in debate here is actually sh, and it would mean um, it, what, what um, the precept says to encourage and aid everyone to donate and remonstrate and causing your family to have longevity and wealth um, over generations and forever to be without worry. And I think they took the first part of it. Um, the general system here, of course, is the meaning of what the steel is about anyway. But that, I think, is the source for this particular line. Um, and then they're promising, if you encourage and donate even a single hair, those whose names are etched, oh, I forgot to put names, those whose names are etched on the side of the statue will be complete. But again, there might be another character out of the complete here. So this particular line is coming out of this particular Lingbao text, I, I think. A little bit more complicated, and now we're getting into really sort of deep trouble here. This is line number three. Again, I just want to show you where it is on the original. Um, this is this line here, right? Very obscure line, uh, very problematic characters. And this one I've not quite figured out, but I'll give you some ideas of what I think we might go with this line, line number three. First of all, what are the nine um, darknesses? <clears throat> So the nine darknesses um, are the cosmogonic um, notion in the link in, in the link bar scriptures. This is from the from the um, chapters in red script, maybe one of the most important of all the link bar scriptures. Um, so um, here the, the celestial worthy is contemplating so he's, he's sort of laying out the world as we as we have it. All right, so he's controlling his mind. Um, and then at this point, he begins to control yin and yang, and he determines the kalpas and transitions and the rivers and you know the calendar. All he's sort of doing all of that in, in his contemplation. Um, and then he sort of points at Tai Wu, um, and then he calmly he whistles calmly at the nine darknesses. Right. So we have a sense that the nine darknesses are something that that at, at that level of his contemplation. And but also what you think about this this whistling part for a second. Again, we have, we have another sense of what this Zhou Xuan um, is from a, a little bit later in the same text. Um, here we have um, a sense that the, the original births of all things um, was, was at the moment of, or the location of these nine darknesses. Right? But this, this may not quite give us enough information. So there's another passage um, that's quoted in, in the Yunji Jitian um, this is from a, a text that's probably, um, oh, it's not, it, it's, it's, it's probably from, 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 from now a missing um, Shangqing text. But it's, yeah. it's really, yeah. yeah. You have two minutes. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be done very soon. I'll be done very soon. Okay. In, in any case, um, in this particular cosmogonic story, um, what we have is that the nine darknesses are the final stage of the original cosmogony of the creation, and from nine they return to one. So nine, the nine darknesses are, are really this, this very high, highest, almost ultimate level of, of existence, or even so sort of pre-existence. So this is what this line is really sort of um, trying to, to evoke. Um, another line in, in the passage, I, I've got I'll, two more minutes. Um, and another line that's kind of problematic here is line number two. Um, I'm going to talk about this, this, um, this for very first line here, this last four characters, um, and what they might actually re be referring to. And you can see this quite, both Li Song and, and Wei Hongli dis disagree a lot about what they are. I think um, the line is actually uh, Hua Xing Yin Jing. And this comes from a very interesting story. I just want to tell you this story um, about the previous life of another one of, of from the same text from this Jataka tales. Um, um, this is from, from the Chiming Tiendi previous life when he was uh, a, a woman. 
um, or girl named Guayi, Guayin, who couldn't, she was mute at birth. And at some point she in fact um, gets her, she gets her voice by getting the Lingbao, one of the Lingbao texts. She's invited back to the palace in the time of drought and she whistles and her whistling brings down rain. And, uh, and uh, following that, she transforms her shape and hides her, and, and, and hides her radiance. And then she's reborn once again. She's in fact reborn once again is yet, is yet another woman at your tongue. But this I think is in fact is what is this, 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 what this line actually is. I think it should, it should be Hua, Hua Xing, Yin Jing and not uh, any of these sort of combination here. So this is to, just to summarize uh, very quickly, sort of I have many other things I can say about this, but I think the correct reading for some of these uh, would be that the 45 members of the society install this statue in wishing to announce their endeavor. The teacher of Tao is always thrive, having transformed their bodies and hid their radiances. They, that is the ancestors, flourishing the nine heavens or seven ancestral generations arise to the halls. All members of society, old and young, will benefit and flourish and benefit um, at the end of their lives, if you complete their study of Tao, they will be refined in Vermilion Mount and roam free the Golden Towers to encourage and aid by donating even single hair, those whose names are etched on the side of the statue will complete Chang Tao, complete the Tao. So it might be missing character. The point of all of this is not simply to correct the text. The point of all of this is to show that um, these local uh, Taoists in North China had access to the Lingbao texts. I might be wrong about some of these conjectures, but I think we have to take it very, very seriously that they knew very well what they were doing. The authors of these inscriptions, and I'm going through a lot of these inscriptions very carefully, um, read these texts very carefully, used them in ways which will not necessarily be what we tend to think of the way they might be used, um, but it allows us to really think about these transmission networks, what people read and how people used um, their texts. Thank you. Thank you, Gil, for your uh, <clears throat> very rich presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. And uh, now it, this is a Q&A session. Now, now is the time for um, I, I can answer uh, uh, Liu Xun's um, question already. Okay. So Liu Xun in, in the chat is asking about the original uh, physical, the, the original in situ locations of the stele um, in their orientations. And that's a really fantastic question. It's really unfortunate that we, we hardly have any of these stones in situ. Um, in fact, we have some of them uh, placed in some of the museums clearly in the sort of Sort of facing the wrong way. Um, the very first um, stone that I mentioned in, in the earlier um, talk, the She, the she family stele, for example, is, is placed in the Lintong Museum um, with its, um, the face facing in sort of, so sort of one face is facing sort of into the museum and the other face is facing sort of back out. Um, so you would think that the, fa the inside face is the front face, but uh, Li Song has already noticed that that in fact is wrong. It's, it's, so it's, in, it's in reverse. Um, so presumably originally they would have been placed according to the current directions, but um, it's very hard to, to sort of know because as far as, as far as we know, I mean, all of them now are, are, are in all kinds of collections and uh, local museums and so on. So it's very hard to know. We don't even know if they were placed in in where they were placed. Some of them, some of them on this inscription say that they were placed like by power. Sometimes they they placed by intersections. Sometimes they seem to be placed by a temple, but it's not quite clear where the original locations um, would have been. Okay. Yeah, 
呃，当时我在呃失恋以前呢，我在道教美术史上面把他的资料详细的进行了一篇梳理。呃，当时认那些字呢。呃，很不好认。大家知道，这个北朝的字，尤其这个碑上的字呢，有两个问题。一个呢是它刻工的刻的不规范，呃，这个笔画添加和减增减的情况很常见。呃，第二个问题呢，就是南北朝的时候呢，中国的各个地方的文字很不统一，很不统一呢，这样的呃，它的这个字呢就不规范，呃，就是哪怕是。呃，正规的书写都不规范，何况这种民间的刻写。所以呢，当时我在读这些碑文的时候呢，主要是根据那些文字的字形，呃，最接近的字，或者是那个呃词最能够说通的那个词，这样的一个读法去读的它。这个李福教授呢，我看他最近的这个工作，刚才听他的演讲，呃，我觉得做的非常有意思。他对我的前面的。呃，十年前的工作做了一个新的补充，就是从道经的角度来找这些相关的词，可能这些重要的词应该是什么样的词，怎么来解读这个词？呃，我觉得这个工作做得非常的好。呃呃，从这进去呢，我想这田良宽碑呢，只是一个一个起点，还有很重要的。呃，你像他刚才提到的姚伯多的照相碑，那个更复杂。姚伯多照相碑上面有有好几千字，那个上面的重要的概念，如果我们要跟灵宝经或者其他的一些呃道经啊来对的话呢，可能会有更多更多的这样的一些问题产生，我们需要更多的来讨论。当时这个起点我觉得非常好，就从田良宽照相碑这个问题来开始来讨论这些文字，他们跟道经的。这种关系，呃，这是一个方面。另一方面呢，我想到的另一个问题呢，就是，呃，关于教派的问题。因为我们现在，如果是我们引用像林宝金这样的一些，呃，我们来讨论他们，呃，可是我们还是不是应该考虑另外一个问题，就是在长安附近这个地方。在北朝的时候，他们主要的教派是不是还是天师道的更加占主流？我们怎么样来考虑天师道和这个灵宝的这样的一些差异的一些问题？这些问题，我们呃一个方面呢是从文字方面我们进行讨论，另一方面呢，可能更加有难度的就是在照相方面。我们能不能够有所区分？因为在天师道这方面，我们照看到的照相，我们比较多的说的都是老君，啊，太上老君，呃，是天尊或者是元始天尊这样一个这样的照相还是比较罕见的，在北朝的时候呢非常少见，呃，隋代呢就开始逐渐的多起来。这个当然一定是与隋代开始中国的南方北方。开始互相的交融，然后道教内部的互相的融合，与这个有很大的关系。呃，当时在北朝的它相对孤立的一个地方，在长安这个地方，跟南朝的关系不是太密切，所以这个照相，我们怎么来理解他的这种教派的问题？呃，所以我们这个文字的解读呢，可能一方面。呃，需要跟道经的一些概念和描述结合起来。另一方面呢，我们通过它进一步的来解释我们这些照相。我想这个可能是我们需要进一步来去更加深入做的工作。呃，当然，这个李福教授的这一目前的这一段的工作，我觉得做的非常的好啊、呃，我觉得很受启发。呃，今天这个学习了他的一些新的一些成果，很好的。好，谢谢啊。哦、嗯，呃 ，OK， 呃。呃，我我还讲几句，我刚才还没说完。还有白冰教授的发言，呃，这个白冰教授的呢，我觉得也说的非常的好，因为对武当山的关注呢，我从也是十多年以前，呃，我就去了几次武当山。武当山的呢，尤其是他刚才提到的武龙宫，他们正在那里做发掘，哎、呃，我感觉到非常高兴。他们因为武龙宫呢是一个已经废弃了有一百多年。呃，在这个民国初期的时候呢，就被火给烧了。那个大型的建筑，现在呢，这个地方政府呢正在想重建它。所以结合这个工作呢，这个考古队进去，他们在那里做这些工作，非常的好。呃。
因为五人宫呢是整个武当山地区呢最偏远的一个地方，那个地方呢有，实际上是我们从他当时的规模来推想的是明代的时候道教最集中的，呃，也是那个相最大的地方，因为它的地盘也很大，那个道观的面积也很大，比现在我们见到的武当山地区的这每一个，呃，这些道观的面积都要大，并且那个建筑更加要高大。尺度也更加高大的多，里面的那个真武像也比金顶上的真武像要精美的多得多。这两个真武像，一个是武武龙宫上面的这个金铜的真武像和金顶上面的这个金龙的真武真武像，这都应该是明代在皇帝在北京紫禁城里面做好了以后运去的，都不是当地的。所以，我们如何把这段的历史？嗯，通过考古的发掘和明代宫廷的支持道教，或者是在紫禁宫里面、紫禁城里面建造这些像，还有巨大的石碑，这都是在紫禁城里面建造的，运过去。我们如果能够把这一段的历史能够把它揭示出来，我觉得就太有贡献了。那通过五龙宫这样一个线索进进去，因为现在五龙宫呢，武当山的情况比较复杂。因为他的呃几个核心的道观呢，是属于道教协会所管辖。道教协会所管辖呢，这样呢，我们做学术研究的就不太好插手进去。而像这个五龙宫这样的，由呃没有道观管辖，而是由这个考古队先切入进去，这就是一个很好的一个切入点。所以这个是两条线，在武当山是有两条线的。呃，不同的切入，一个是道教协会的一个方式，一个呢就是从考古的这样一个方式，这个是不太一样的，所获得的资料也是不一样的。那这样我们怎么能够把这两个方面能够把它结合起来来来做？我想可能我们就互相都能够有启发。那尤其是对我们的考古的材料有很多的启发，利用这些明代的宫廷的材料，还有那些在道教协会所控制的那些我们现在见不到的。那些还有相当多的东西。好、哦，谢谢谢谢谢李聪老师，因为有有其他学者在举手。呃 ，Frederick， hello， uh, thanks for two very exciting talks. I speak English, that's okay, right? My Chinese. Yeah, is, sure, sure, sure. I understand, but I don't know if you will understand me speaking.、Uh, I have a kind of a follow-up question on what Professor Song Li just said about the question of the paizi, actually, of the of the jiao pai, and It's kind of a complicated one. If it is from the Chang'an area, did you do we know or do you know more about the production process of these stele? Were they produced by people who also produce Buddhist stele, for example, which we have, of course, in the same area a lot? So there's a question: Could there be also an interaction on that level, not on a complex scriptural level, but on the level of people who were carving these things, doing these things? And then again, the next question would be: Would these terms that you isolate from the Lingbao scriptures could they be appearing in popular Buddhist scriptures of the time as well? You know、okay. what I? Okay, yeah, that's my question.、Um, shall Shall I answer now or wait for? Yeah, yeah, you just answer because we don't have.、Uh, yeah, we only、okay. have twenty minutes. You know. Yeah. So so so.、Um, You know, Professor Professor Li Song's question and 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 Enrique's question.、Um, it's it's really sort of at the heart of what what I what I said in the beginning about sort of the way I I framed the entire project about my particular studies. But I think it applies to a lot of the Taoist materials. And that we need to really distinguish when we talk about Tao Pai.、Um, mm -hmm. We really want to be very careful between sort of imagining texts as living creatures versus people who are transmitting texts.、Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, if if we just create, if say, okay, Lingbao texts are only given to certain people, and Changqing texts are given only to certain people, and Tianxi Dao texts only to certain people,、um, that's not the way to imagine this, right? So what you have are are lineages in which masters are giving texts to disciples, but they might be from different different scriptural corpuses, right? They, they depending what access they have,、um, it's so so. As, as as Li Song mentioned, on this particular, what's interesting in the Tianlan Quan Stele, for example, is that the imagery is of Lao Jun, right? It's not of of, of Yachi Tianzun.、Um, in fact, Yachi Tianzun very rarely shows up. There's only there's very very few images of Yachi Tianzun in his early、uh, 
um, early groups. But most, but but from the from the from the words that they have, or from the language, it's very clear is that they're borrowing a lot of their ideas from the Lingbao texts. And in fact, um, I'd mentioned you know Dao Min and Dao Shi, but we also have uh, one or two stilis in which we we have Sandong Fa Shi. So we do actually have people who are very clearly Lingbao kind of masters, but they, there's but there's very few. The vast majority are not are, are simply mentioned as Dao Shi or Nan Guan. So we don't really have a very clear affiliation. Um, I think we need to think of, of lineages in the in, in so both in a narrower way, but also in a broader way. In a narrower way, it is literally the teacher and his disciples, right? So whoever has access to text and they're the ones who are writing the texts. We want to think of them in a broader way, in a sense that everybody so everybody's in some kind of network. All right. So just saying, you know, Ling Bao Pai doesn't really mean anything. We have to really be very specific and, you know, what text do they have? And one, one of the things that I hope we can do if we do enough of this work is understand which texts were actually circulating. Um, you know, there's like 40, maybe there's a lot of Ling Bao texts where all of them present, which ones are popular, which ones are being used, how they're being used. They're, they're different, right? We tend to imagine them as if like you get a single packet, like an encyclopedia, and that's what you have. But that's not, I think, the way they were being used. Um, your second half of your question, uh, so that's why I talk about them as more communities of practice mm -hmm. rather than as, as lineages, um, Dao, as Dao Pai. But your question, the second question is really interesting. So I, I, I think the production of this, of the, of the steel is with the thing of, of two or three separate parts. Um, one is people writing the text. And one are people in, you know, ordering the actual, well, first we have the people ordering the, the thing itself, right? And then you have people writing a text, a votive text, and then we have people carving the stone, which are probably not the same people. Um, I think people carving the stone, probably a lot of them were stonemasons who probably also did, also did the Buddhist stuff. And you can see in the, in yes. the early materials that the, the, the Taoist um, images are very, very similar to the, to the Buddha ones with variation, with variations, but clearly the model they're coming from are the, are the Buddha models. But the texts um, are not, for, I mean, they, they appear to be formulaic, but they're not. I mean, they're really, each one is kind of unique. Um, I think they're being written by people who really know what they're doing, who have access to text and have something very specific to write. Now, the, per the person carving might, make, might be making mistakes, as Li Song says, you know, the person carving the text may not necessarily be the one who wrote the text um, and may not necessarily understand, may, might make some mistakes in, you know, sh between Xing and Xing or, or, or something like that. Um, the, the, the words that I pointed out in particular are not found in, 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 in Buddhist texts. They're, they really are in, in Taoist texts. Chen Zhu is found in some Buddhist texts, but not in this particular usage. But all the other locations, the Jin Chuan, the Zhu Ling, and these are very, very clearly, um, very Ling, not, not just Taoist, but very much Ling Bao, uh, Ling Bao terminology. Okay, so. so. Can I, just one quick, so you would think that the people who wrote these texts were actually Taoist monks or something kind of paid to put that up or the people, very short. Yes or no, the, the one who wrote the text, um, yes. if the Taoist priests, um, well, I mean, it really depends what you mean by Taoist priest, but I, I, I think, it, I think, it, I think yes, it's someone who, who had access okay. to the text and really thought out. Okay. But the family who put it up, let's say Tian Kuan is the representative of this family, right? Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, he's like maybe the chief donor or the head of the clan mm -hmm. or something. He said, I want to, I want to put this up. These are the texts I want to use. These yeah. are the ideas I have. Yeah. About them. So what kind of language do we use for this? It could be he himself might be the person who's doing it, or it could be the Yishu, you know, across from him okay. on, on that on that sensor is the Yishu. Might maybe it was him. Or all of them together, sitting together, saying, playing with their texts, and, mm -hmm. and thinking what would be good phrases to use. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Liu Xun. You have another question. Can you? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. 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 Uh, 我那个因为梅丽教授那时候还在他带我和高万商两个人就去了那个武隆宫
，把那个就是说宫址的那个宫宫殿遗址，就是武隆宫那个宫殿遗址的那个地形都挖掘。那个进去的两个，就是说那个钟鼓，还有了那个钟鼓楼，还有那个就是灵官的灵官殿。呃，我记得印象很清楚的，我现在问的问题就是关于这个道教明代的那个道教的这个造像。刚才李松教授讲讲的金像是从北京这个教主，北京祝寿，呃，北京自助，然后呢拿到移到武当武当宫来的。呃，我记得我们去看的时候。对我震撼很大的就是那个灵官的膝盖，那个膝盖的部分呢，它已经磨损了，里边一层一层的露出来的，比方说草泥、灰，还有那个棉，呃，这个刚好了，跟我在前在呃呃呃两千四零四年零五年的时候，我在河南的南阳地方，跟一位照相师，就是神像的照相师，他在后来中越呀、啊，在好多地方，在在山东的很多地方。照相，他说他祖，他是他祖上是明代的，传下来的一个铸像的神像的一个工人，他讲描述的那些，我做了口述史，拍了他的电影，那个里边的讲的细节就跟我看到的几乎是一模一样，所以对我很震撼。我就想请白冰教授能不能再介绍一下，就是说你们的这个现在的这个发掘计划里边，有没有对就是说。道教照相，就是明清以来的道教照相里面的一些技术上的、物质方面、材料方面的东西，有没有？还有一个就是说风格源流上有没有一个呃，有一没有没有一个项目在关注？我觉得那个现在大概看明代的照相里头，因为我们去日本呢、啊、看到的很多木制木木木雕的木木木木木木制的神像，可是这个泥塑的。在北方还比较，在西北方面比较好保存，但是在中原这一带，包括武当山那这个地方，好像存留的非常非常少了。我就想知道有没有一个专门的一个一个小组，在这个发掘队里头，对这个神像的这个部分做做很细致的，比方说，呃，发掘和研究或者这种，这个这是跟白教授的一个问题。对，好，看好，谢谢刘军教授的问题。呃，得武隆宫，呃，这个在武当山这个这个工作了，我也是很偶然才才才这个，呃，才参与进去。呃，我是前年，应该是年底吧，去过是武当山去这个参观，因为前些年在湖北做一些这种，嗯、呃，做光这个发掘这个楚墓，发掘这个汉墓哈，后来他们说他是那个武当山，呃，做到叫考古大师，就说，呃，你你这个文章。你就好好看一看，就后来一直我在前年年底才去过一次，就是我跟我感觉非常震撼，跟刘军教授你的感觉是一样的啊。嗯，那么这个当时的这个他们河北省考古所呃已经这个呃对这个回龙观做了个发掘，二零一九年，当时他们正在准备申请武隆宫的发掘，武隆宫因为他是当地政这个这个政府啊，他们是的确是也有道学人参与进来哈，呃，准备要呃就说这个要进行呃呃。大概是做一些开发，旅游方面的开发，呃，可能还做一些复建，所以他们当地政府也非常积极，呃，这个这个当地道士们也很很想这个考古进去，能够能够把一些东西搞清楚，再帮他们争取一些什么经费之类的哈。说，但这个就是这个是是很好的一个事儿，因此就也到去年吧，呃，让这个河北省考古所就跟我们川大这边就合作，但又联络了当地这个就是这个是武当山博物馆，对、呃。那还有实验，他们这个应该是一个应该是一个叫文博方面的机构，几家他们合作呢，就向北京方面提出申请。那么当时这个批准的是五千平米的这个发掘面积。去年因为新冠肺炎这个事情呢，呃，算面积没有挖完，大概只挖了两两千多、三千的样子。那那今年的呃这个义务批准的这个这个就是这个这个三这个现在三千加起来一共是八千。呃，那在他们这个计划的重点还是就是对，呃，已经这个呃埋在地下的，呃，就是这个呃，这个就是这个乌龙宫看起来我们就那张照片的西边这个部分，呃，那地方完全都被被这个土就掩掩埋了，呃，那那地方要做发掘，现在我们就已经报了地面的东西呢，不是不是重点，呃，那么这个呃，当时我们当当时涉及到有有几个想法，一个当肯定是要把这个乌龙宫。他他这个就这个发掘的八千平米，呃，他的这种呃这种公馆间隙布局，呃，包括包括他这个说你们从结构把它搞清楚。当后面我去看的时候，他们发现很多做，呃，应该是废弃之后坍塌下去那些瓦，很大的一些瓦，那些瓦砾啊那一层，他们请了北京大学
的这个就是这个旅游团队他们组组建，他们非常有有应该说还有很很有经验，所以大概是就是这个呃这个这个古建这块呢肯定是有很重要的方面，呃，但是到底能挖出多少东西像那那个时候就就完全没法预判。呃、嗯，但后来发现情况还不错，呃，有有碑刻，里面有些这个大概扔在这个日式月池里面，呃，这里面就有些有些这个神像，呃，还有一些这种这种呃，一一一什么钱币，呃，还有一些大概一些这种青花瓷，现在性质不太清楚，还整理还没展开。嗯，那么那这个的确里面这个呃神像，我想这个池子里面、这个、挖出东西，显然都是不是很好的，或者质量不是很大的。就像刚才刘教你说，武当山这个当中啊，就是这个，呃，他的这个神像是我们非常值得关注的一个东西，呃，那么这些神像呢，它相当一部分呢，现在集中到了武当山博物馆，呃，我不知道您上次去看的时候，武当博物馆开没开馆，大概里面有可能有六七百件，那么还有部分呢，在他们这个在这个在云南市的他们这个武当武当山的这个云南市他们文管所。当然还有相当部分是散落在现在购物公馆，那么这种里面，呃，但我也住在武隆宫那个地方，呃，就说你说刚才那些名官哈，呃，当时他们说的东西很早，我我倒一看呢，我觉得当刚才到其实我们可以从有这个这个工艺这个角度啊，或者说你们这种这种就是这种技术角度很好的观察一下，嗯、呃，那我觉得可能是不会不会像他们说他们早，呃，应当可能我觉得可能是还是个清代的东西。呃，因为现在包括那那个那个，就是说我们进进三门之后看到那个那个小青瓦的那个那个建筑啊，大多是后来清代，呃，甚至可能是因为现在我对古建我不太熟悉，我我我们这个有个可以专门做就就靠古建做研究，那个建筑我觉得很晚的一个东西，应该是清代的东西，甚至不排除我是民国时的东西，呃，就它它里面东西可能早早往往都混杂在一块但是的确这个照相这块我今年是呃呃。呃准备申报一个比较大的考题，我刚刚我的这个四川三地四川地区，呃，关于这个就是这种西南塘沟事故事的这个这个考题刚刚结束，所以正准备要申报一个就是就专门就是对武当山的这道教神像，对这一千多件要做整理。原来我是想整理做碑刻，但是碑刻那个量实在太大了，可能我估计因为还要做调查，呃，这个就是这种呃，方圆这个武当山是一百，应该是可能两百平方公里的样子，那个量可能会非常非常庞大。呃，说后来我放弃了，作为个后后来我去跟武当山当地我们商人的结果，就是准备先去要就就说这个，呃，这个叫做这个就是公关，哎，做这个就照相的，就是这个神像这块的这个就是整理和研究。呃，那么这个，呃，所以我们是有各有分工的，就是那个那个武武隆宫的发掘呢，主要是湖北省考古研究所，他们更专业，而且是他们这个耗费的经费我非常非常庞大，需要国家文物局的连续不断的支持。呃，才能开展下去。那么这个，呃，我当我我会我会我会参加，我派学生，我的学生现在还在那边做发掘。呃，前期有学生参与进来进来。那么这个可能是这个到照相这块呢，呃，这个我们跟他们达成一个一个这个初步的就是这个这个想法，就是我们我们从这个从从这个呃国家社会基金这个之后我们申请经费。但湖北省考湖北省这个文物局他们也也许会考虑各位部经费，我们可以慢慢把它动起来。呃，所以现在我们这个是有这么个计划。呃，这是目前现在这个，因为今天你们都知道，现在这个、这个国内现在是新冠疫情的，但是最近又有点这种，呃，又有点又又精神比较紧张，所以我都还没来得及去那边，呃，这个跟他们呃商讨这个事儿。但是这个计划我们已经做了，就是要做这个关于照相的，呃，这块的这种一个系统的整理和研究。因为而且的确上面的话，就像刚才李荣教授也谈到，那么这像啊很多量不是特别多，呃，但是呢有大概那么几十件，在我的。武当山博物馆的库房中看到，里面是有很多是带有这这种这种呃这种这种里面这个就它是它是什么时间是哪些呃这个照这个像啊，它是有有有很长这个一段文字的，所以这些文字就是说我们如果把它就是很好进行整理，能够能够就是把这个就是这个这些照相它是从从哪儿来是吧？是是谁照的？呃，什么时间这个照的是吧？照照的干嘛？是不是？呃，当然包括你刚才。刘教授谈到的，就是说他的这个工艺的问题，这个技术的问题，我们想从就是这种，呃，这种这种这种科技的角度啊，那是都有有很重要的观察点的。呃，说目前这个项目呢，只是还处在我们这个一个一个，就是说还没起，还没启动，所以说我们现在已经已经有这种想法了，而且也跟国家申请经费，但是今年很遗憾，我听说我这个项目没有没有获得没有获得这个获准，但是我会继续报的，或者通过其他的途径，呃，再再去继续去申请经费吧，大概情况就这样。
Oh, 谢谢。呃、uh, ， now the last question. Okay, Tobias. Um, at first, you know, I would thank um both of you to to share those materials, and I mean, especially Bibin, that he was willing so to share so much material with us. You know, like of of stuff that I have not seen before. Um, and you know, it's really exciting to just get this wealth of materials just placed in front of you in such a short, concise form. Um, the question that I have is. Um, what you both did was still in line very strongly with with iconography and philology and archaeology as disciplines. And I think one question that comes up, and I think um, Gil raised it by 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 um, referring to the to the religious study theoretic model of lived religion, and we have to ask ourselves what we want to do with these materials a bit more. And so, you know, to follow up on this, um, uh, I attended a lived religion conference not long ago at St. Louis University and there I was the only person who worked on stuff prior to 1800 and there's a good reason for that because we lack context right we only get leftovers you only get stuff that we have to I would say imaginatively re-envision or revive from what we have and that's the part um, that I haven't seen yet um, and so I'm wondering you know uh in this specific case, skill or by bin, if you want to perhaps say something about one of the objects that you've seen is, so how do you re-envision what this steely actually is in a lived religious context? And the, sec the second question would be, how do you avoid um, not basically making these objects just align or become assimilated towards canonical texts? Because there's definitely a danger in the way how Gil was comparing Lingbao scriptures with these steelies and how do you basically decide that something is actually really a Ling Bao reference or Ling Bao connection or basically how do you at the end streamline these objects towards a Ling Bao canonical text in this moment and so how do you deal with those two questions so these are two two things re-envision a tiny bit what you think the religious context would look like and the second would be a methodological question of how to avoid um certain kind of inferences but from canonical scriptures Right. Well, that, that's 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 really the question. That's that's actually the heart of what this project is. I mean, so so what we're doing now is sort of collecting all kinds of information and so on. But the reason, the way I explained it in, in the sort of the first half of, of, of my presentation, sort of the setup for the for the project itself, the very existence of these steelies is kind of evidence for lived religion because it's not in the texts. Um, the, the, their very existence sort of rounds counter to what we think the texts actually say about Taoism, right? The fact that I can trace, you know, some of the words into Lingbao texts means that people were, were that it means that the texts were alive and well and functioning, but the, the, the making of the statues is something that the local the locals decided to do this, probably as, as Rika mentioned, probably because of Buddhist impact. So, so, uh, and you can sort of, you know, if, if you sort of think about um, we have names of people, we can actually know who put up the steelies, we can trace their family relationships. We can actually make a lot of interesting statements about each one of the steelies, depending on how many people are actually mentioned there and links to other steelies. So we can actually create little, little, little life worlds for one of each one of these steelies. Uh, the steelies in themselves cannot be explained textually. There is no canonic function for these steelies. There's, there's, there's no such thing. The fact that I can trace words on this to, to Lingbao text, what it means to me is that we have evidence here for Lingbao circulating as you know, people having Lingbao texts. So my, my whole point is to remove it from the textual level and place it into the social interaction with the texts and what they're doing with the texts. Um, as Lee Sun pointed out, um, the imagery on the, on the imagery on the actual imagery on the on on the steelies does not conform to any textual to textual model. Not, they're not saying, "Oh, it says in a text to do this, so we'll do that." They're, they're not doing that at all. In fact, there seems to be almost a discrepancy between the imagery, which is you know very often Lord Lao, and you know the texts that are coming from other other sources so that i think is is one way to be that's why phrases as lived religion they're, they're clearly living some form of Taoism, which is not what we would imagine if we just use the texts right the texts we have are very often to be used by by priests i mean not to be used by by general public for stuff um but this is not the way being used here um so i think this is evidence for 
some form of lived religion. Some of the materials that by being mentioned, you know, um, you know, the stones with 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 talismans inside the tombs. I mean, this is all evidence. I mean, it's not maybe lived, maybe that's dead, but it is <laughs> the usage by lived people of materials that we tend to think of, you know, it's kind of just being imagined. Maybe people didn't actually do this at all. Um, the stones with the talismans that by being mentioned, and this is, this is actually in about scripture about about the fivefold, um, um, the fivefold, the five stones. And anyway, I don't remember the title, but uh, woolly and sure. Uh, so it's, it's a text. You know, you think okay, it's just complete intellectual exercise, but very clearly, people from the Tang and Sung all the way to the Ming were, were using these text to actually make burial um, artifacts. That's evidence for lived religion. People are actually using the materials and not necessarily in the ways that we would imagine if we just read the text as it stands. So I think part of what we want to do with this project is to collect this information um, and present it, but then actually think exactly along your lines of what would be a good method um, to, to use this material to show how people were actually living their religion, living Taoism or living, you know, some kind of the, the combination of Taoism with Buddhism or Taoism with some local tradition or, or whatever it is um, that we're finding. That's that's the whole point of what this this is this is about. Okay, I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I think, uh, friends, uh, in Asia, the, the time is pretty late, so. Probably we should uh, we should uh, stop here uh, today for today's event. And uh, Mike, do you have a further announcement? Just to say thank you everybody for coming, spending your morning, your day, your evening, late evening perhaps even with us. Uh, please look forward uh, to more events like this. I'm just going to put the link to the Global Dallas Studies Forum website once again in the chat. Oops, sorry, put in the wrong place in the chat. Um, there you go, and you will also find information about uh, what's going on, as well as recording of this event once it's available to be uploaded. So thank you, everybody. This has been great. Look forward to next time very much. If anybody wants to chat, we can stay online for a bit to, to talk. Yep. Yeah. But I will stop recording now. See you. Thank you. And thank if you.